<clears throat> Who here has ever prayed for a parking space? Right? You ever find yourself praying, God, I need a good parking space? You ever find yourself praying, you know, just one more first down, just touchdown, home run, whatever? Right? We pray for uh, interesting things. We pray for those who are ill. And we start wondering about that as well. Uh, we pray, if we pray for someone who is ill and they recover, is that because I prayed for them? If I pray for someone who is ill and they die, what, what, what do we do with that? Well, what's that mean? Right? Is prayer a gift, a burden, a responsibility? Is it something that we have to do like mowing the lawn? Or is it something we get to do like having a meal with a friend? The people who seem to have prayer most figured out, the people who are most at peace, calm, who seem to have this communion with God, um, I honestly find a bit intimidating. Uh, the sort of mini Mother Teresas or prayer warriors running around, you feel odd asking these questions because they just seem like they have it all figured out. But we're, we're going to take a swing at one of these questions today. I, we're going to do one. I can't answer every question, but we'll, we'll try one big one. Why don't I get what I pray for? Why don't I get what I pray for? If I'm praying for something, and I'm praying for it, so it must be a good thing, right? Uh, why doesn't it always happen? This seems to be a fair question, because uh, this is what Jesus seems to be getting at, and what he talks about with this fig tree, right? He curses this fig tree, and uh, the disciples ask about this, and he says, If you have faith and do not doubt, you shall not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to the mountain, be taken up and cast in the sea, it shall happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. So seeing prayer like this, the temptation when we read that passage is to start to imagine prayer as a way to sort of harness power. It's a way to harm, harness omnipotence. It's like you get it yourself a, a remote control, and you write God on the top of it. And now you have a way to go click, right? You sort of you pray for something. Hey God, can I get something? Click, and then it happens. It, 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 this does. It, it, that's not quite how I'm sure we're thinking about it, but that, that's what it kind of feels like, right? It, it does run into some obvious problems if that's what prayer is, because let's say you're trying to buy a house and you're you're praying, God, I need a really good deal on a house. Click. What's the guy who is uh, who owns the house praying? God, I really need someone to pay my asking price on the house. Click. I mean, what, what, who wins? Who, whose God remote is better? I mean, if, if prayer is a way of, it's a, if it's a remote control, it, it becomes a question of what, who has the bigger remote control? Who has, this is the biggest remote control in our house. I mean, you get a lot of buttons. But uh, who has the bigger batteries? I mean, just, if prayer is a way of uh, harnessing God's power, and, and I pray for something and it doesn't happen, then we start to ask these horrible questions. Do I really believe? Is my faith lacking? Do I have improper motives? Do I have unconfessed sins? I mean, I've heard people ask these questions and say, you know, if you're praying and not getting something, it must be because you have unconfessed sins. And I think all of those questions are horrible to ask because they miss the point of Jesus. Jesus does good things because Jesus is good, not because we're good. Our prayers and whether prayers or answers don't depend upon our holiness, they depend on God's goodness, God's holiness, not because we have a, a God remote, right? And, and so, and, and also this, this way of reading the passage, uh, taking it literally, um, if we're going to start taking the passages of literally Jesus, then I recommend you go home and sharpen your knives real well, because the next time you do something stupid, you might have to cut off your hand, right? Jesus says, uh, if your hand causes you to sin, uh, cut it off and throw it from you, for it's better to enter the kingdom of God with one hand than to burn. Um, he also says that about eyes, too. And, and I don't know what the right tool to pluck your eye out is, and if you know, don't tell me. But uh, if we're going to start taking Jesus literally, we're going to be half blind and one handed uh, rather quickly. We, we, but we can, as we read how Jesus teaches, he uses hyperbole and exaggeration. He, he it stretches a point. Yes, it is very clear. But pray even for mountains to be moved. Be bold in your prayers. But I, but I don't think I, I don't expect to see any mountains flying through the air uh, today, and probably not tomorrow. All right. Furthermore, if we read of prayers in Scripture, not just read about them, but actually read about people praying, we see that there are times when prayers are simply not answered. 
Right? There are pray, pray, praying, there's prayers that happens in the Bible. Uh, Paul prays. And, and if anyone should know how to, to work a God remote, right, it would be Paul. But Paul prays uh, three times for this thorn to be taken from his side, this pain in, in his side. We have no clue what the pain in his side was, this thorn in his side, this messenger of Satan. Um, <coughs> but what we do know is he didn't like it. He wanted to get rid of it, and that what he found after praying again and again is that God was teaching him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is, is, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Paul uh, had to learn that hard lesson. If you do everything by yourself, then you are glorifying you and not God. And so Paul had to learn this lesson, and it happened because his prayers were not answered. Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, pass, take this cup from me. You know, I'll drink any other cup, but please not this cup, but thy will be done. He prays that multiple times, and, and Jesus drinks that cup. So if prayer is not a technology used to harness and control God, if there are times when prayers are, go, are going to go unanswered, no matter how holy we are, how do we understand that prayers are answered? What do we think about how God fulfills prayers? There are times when prayers are fulfilled miraculously. I have stood by the bedside of people who have had no right to be alive. If you know what the ascending aorta is, I have stood by the bedside of a dude whose ascending aorta burst. right, And he, he's alive. He's kicking. No right to be alive. I have stood by a woman who told me about how her son uh, drowned in the lake over up in Kirksville. And she spent a year just in horrible, horrible grief, just wrapped with grief, until one day on the couch she was praying, God, take this from me, I can't take it. And uh, she felt something like warm water upon her, and she had peace. It's what she needed. And she was, but I walked into a room, and I know it was going to be bad as a chaplain at a hospital. I walked into a room, and a woman, a mother, handed me her six-month-old daughter who just died because she wanted someone to hold her daughter, but she couldn't be the one to hand her to the morgue. Right? And I had no clue what to say until I did. All right, God answers prayers miraculously. It does happen. It will happen. It's not what usually happens. Right? God does not usually answer uh, prayers miraculously. What, often the way that God answers prayer is, is through each other. God and you and I are the answer to each other's prayers. That's part of my gig as a Christian. Not as a pastor, but as, just as a Christian. It is my gig to be the answer to your prayers. And it is your gig, as Christians, to be the answer to my prayers and to each other's prayers. Not because God gets his remote control, looks down and says, Andy, click, and then all of a sudden I've got to do it. But because I have submitted myself to God's will, and we submit our, each of ourselves, we're submitting ourselves to what God desires, partnering with God to, to be able to work for and with each other in service, to walk with each other through, through suffering, through life, through, through challenges. Now, I don't have all the answers to the questions I asked at the beginning. There will always be mysteries to prayer. There will be times when prayers are offered and what we hope for will happen. And there will be times when it does not. I don't know exactly what prayer is in some ways, but I know what it's not. It's not a remote control to force God to do something. It's not point and click. What I do know prayer is, is most like is conversation. The conversation that happens between a young child and a parent. The young child who brings everything to the parent in the way that that parent listens. And sometimes the parent listens. Sometimes when my young daughter comes to me and says, I want mac and cheese for dinner, she gets what she wants. Sometimes when she comes to me and she wants mac and cheese, she does not get what she wants. I always listen. And sometimes you see what you just kind of roll with it. You see what happens. Our Heavenly Father is no different. Always listening, sometimes changing, sometimes not. And some, what, also the odd thing that happens between a, a parent and a child is that the child starts to pick up the mannerisms of, of, of the parent, right? That, we call that holiness, growing in holiness. As we continue to pray, uh, we are shaped by the one to whom we pray. And it's the same way that our children take our own, on our own mannerisms. I hear Sophia say, hey, and, and I hear myself, but about three foot lower, and I find it vaguely confusing. Right? That's just how children work. Right? It's, it's a two-way relationship, parent and child, both always listening, both always speaking, always clear who's parent. Um, 
And, and that's the clarity of, of, of uh, when we're in prayer. We are praying to Jesus, who is our Lord, submitting ourselves to Him, and in doing so, becoming more like Him. And, and hopefully learning, to, to, learning which mountains we should attempt to move. Not every mountain should be moved. Now, in the end, prayer is far more about what happens in and to us. And this was something I was reminded of this last week. I was with a bunch of other pastors over in St. Joseph uh, learning about uh, prayer and learning about some, many other things. But uh, Brian Zahn, the wise pastor over in St. Joe, pointed out something very important about prayer. And I want to leave you all with this uh, important part of prayer. When the first people are becoming Christian, Acts 2, uh, it tells us what they do. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread, and the prayers. Not to, to prayer, but the prayers. To, the first Christians very clearly committed to themselves to the prayers. And what prayers is that a reference to? It's the prayers of the faith. The Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven. Uh, when Jesus taught people to pray, he didn't just say, you know what, just kind of talk to God. Just kind of emote to God. Just kind of empty yourself. I mean, how often do you find yourself when you're praying, if you have no structure, you're just going to talk to God, you just start rehashing your own angst, your own anxiety, your own focuses, your own hang-ups, right? Jesus teaches us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven. There's a structure to that. That's the, to be devoted to the prayers of, of the people. The prayers of the people across the centuries is a, is a way to submit ourselves. If we want to grow in prayer, to not see prayer as a technology to control God, but a way of submitting ourselves to God, we need to submit ourselves to the prayers of the church. And there are ways to do this. The Methodist prayer book is our hymnal. If you want to know how to begin your day in prayer, bring home a hymnal. We have a few to spare. Uh, buy your own if you want. And... Um, Every hymn is a prayer. We just happen to sing it most of the time. You can read a hymn every morning, and that can be your prayer. There are other, there's the Book of Common Prayer. Um, this is from the Anglican Church. This is, will give you a prayer for every day of the year. It will tell, I mean, here's the prayer for St. Stephen on December 26th. I mean, it will go through and give you readings and prayers and psalms. You can just read the psalms. Read the psalms every morning. The Lutheran Book of Prayer, much shorter, simpler. It... Prayers for home, for Thanksgiving, for Tuesday evening. If you want to pray, to submit yourself to God in prayer, to do so methodically, to do so and, and, and to be formed by it, not just have prayer be a way to rehash our own hang-ups, pick a way of prayer based upon what, how the people of the church have been doing it for centuries. It can be the Lord's Prayer over your cup of coffee, read two hymns at lunch. It can be uh, do evening prayer um, out, of the, out of the hymnal every evening. It can be a uh, weekday. I mean, just pick a habit and start doing it. I will caution you that... Uh, it takes a while to get used to it. I was told by a very wise man uh, that it takes 17 times of feeding a kid a vegetable before they, they're going to like it. Right? Thank you, Dale. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes it takes more than 17 times. My wife finally likes asparagus and, yeah, tell him, honey, honey. Yes, uh, it, it took her more than 17 times. Um, took a small child walking up and saying, here, mommy. It was a great moment. Uh, but if you're going to grow to like something, I mean, and I can't imagine living without asparagus now, but it takes a while to get used to it. If you, are go if you have any inclination that your prayer life is not what it needs to be, if it is anything less than comforting, anything less than satisfying, anything less than a way you feel connected to God, then it's time to try something new. It's time to get uh, a hymnal, a book of common prayer, a Lutheran prayer book. To, it's try time to try something. Something. Pray the Psalms. Time to try something and repeat it, but please know it's like asparagus. It's going to take 17 times trying before you're going to like it. And once you like it, I cannot imagine my life now without the ways that I have stumbled to praying, but I was here three years before I really got that figured out. I've been a pastor for nine, right? I stumbled around for six years as a pastor who's supposed to have it all figured out, right? Before I finally started to get it kind of figured out in my own life. So go home and try something. Put the, the God remote down and uh, try to find a way to pray, uh, to pray that works for you. 
We pray for healing, we pray boldly, we pray to the God who can move mountains, just as a child goes to a parent, to pour out their greatest desires. We pray listening for how we might be the answer of prayer, the prayers of others. We pray with a sure and certain confidence that in the end, God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that we will have questions between now and then. We will never know why it is when I pray for one person they are healed and I pray for another they are not. We are not going to know that. But in the end, death will be defeated. There will be no more tears. Pain and suffering will not have the last word. All will be healed and made whole. Thanks be to God. Amen.